This program is brought to you by Emory University. On February 5th, 2015, the Office of the Provost at Emory University hosted a forum titled Writing and Placing Op-Eds. The panel members discussed the nuts and bolts of writing opinion pieces and editorials based on their own experiences and described how publishing op-eds advanced their scholarship and careers. The speakers were Nathan McCall, lecturer in African American Studies at Emory and a former reporter for the Washington Post, Lynn Huffer, Samuel Candler Dobbs, Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Emory, and Carol Anderson, Associate Professor of African American Studies at Emory. In this video, Professor McCall encourages faculty to emphasize their status as experts and their proven writing abilities when proposing op-ed articles to editors. One of the, uh, one of the editors often credited with helping foster the progression of the op-ed was a man named Herbert Swope. And he said, it occurred to me that nothing is more interesting than opinion when opinion is interesting. <laughs> Note that Herbert Swope said opinion is interesting. He didn't say opinion writing is easy. <laughs> Indeed, when you survey the journalistic landscape today, it's apparent why it's so challenging trying to get um, op-ed pieces published in newspapers. News publications in general are getting smaller. Writers now are forced to vie for diminishing space. At the same time, the universe of opinion writing has expanded greatly over the last decade alone. Everybody and her mother has a blog now. <laughs> so where does that leave academics who aspire to broaden their reach? It may seem intimidating to pitch your ideas to an editor now. But it's doable. I would urge you to take stock of at least two major advantages that you hold over most would-be op-ed writers. First, by editor's standards, we are included in that special group classified as experts. Editors understand that the general public gives credence to what we have to say and what we think. Second, news editors also understand that as academics, we basically know how to write. They know we're skilled at structuring and advancing ideas. The point is, you definitely have a shot at getting op-ed pieces published. I would submit that the biggest challenges rest with demonstrating to editors that you have a command of the mechanics of writing for newspapers. There's a whole range of variables that have to be considered in making the transition for print. In terms of editors, here are some of the ones, just some, that I think are most important uh, to look for, that editors look for. One, first and foremost, a strong pitch. As you know, uh, the pitch is a synopsis indicating clearly what you want to say in the op-ed piece that you're proposing. Editors have to share the pitch during news meetings, and it helps them if your pitch is solid. Editors dread having to try and defend your pitch in a news meeting to their colleagues. I strongly recommend uh, 
that you submit your pitch in writing. It is disastrous, or can be, or will be disastrous if you try a verbal pitch to an editor. Major turnoff. Next, I think uh, editors look for a sense of structure, especially at the top of the piece. Unlike in academic writing, editors and readers in general don't have the patience for our long, leisurely introductions. <laughs> you generally should strive to make your case in the first three or four paragraphs of the piece. These are the paragraphs that will either grab or lose your readers. The next one uh, is called Kiss. I had an editor who was fond of telling his reporters, he'd say Kiss, not in the context of, that it may sound, <laughs> he'd say Kiss. Then he'd say, Kiss stands for Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Editors look for people who can write for a broad audience of readers with varying educational levels. That means we need to strive to simplify wording and simplify sentences. Avoid long, complex sentence structures. Next consideration, uh, writing for space. As you know, brevity is important. Editors look for writers who can make every word count. The New York Times, in terms of length, uh, many editors will tell you, give you a sense of the length of pieces that they want. The New York Times, for example, generally uh, requires that if you submit an op-ed piece, that it be anywhere from 400 to 1,200 words. The next one, um, the importance of clean copy. Clean copy. This goes without saying. We want, you want to make sure that you turn in writing that has no typos and grammatical errors. It should have a sound structure and flow. These days, no publication has the manpower to have someone rewrite your piece. Clean copy makes an editor's job much easier. The next one I'll mention is shoot for a strong kicker. A kicker, as you may know, is the ending of the piece. Everybody likes a good ending, including editors. And there's one strategic point about the kicker. Typically, uh, we submit, uh, the pieces that we submit are going to be longer than budgeted, and we have to fight for every inch of new space in that piece. Editors are trained that if the writing is too long and they need to cut, make cuts, they cut it from the bottom. If you have a strong kicker, it will give them pause. It may buy you a few more paragraphs, <laughs> a few more paragraphs in the piece. So try for a uh, strong kicker. And then finally, of course, is that if and when your piece is published, you want to try to establish um, make sure that you've established a working relationship with that editor. It helps when it's time for you to pitch your next op-ed piece. I could talk about these things uh, more in detail, and I'm sure we're going to do that, but I'm going to stop here. One of the other things that uh, is important uh, when considering pitching an op-ed piece is understanding the publication that you are submitting to. Newspapers, as we know, have different identities. And I'd like to share with you, if I may, since we, I'd like to share um, something someone sent me um, some years ago about the identities 
uh, a fun way to think about the identities of newspapers in this country. It says, the Wall Street Journal is read by the people who run the country. <laughs> the New York Times is read by the people who think they run the country. <laughs> The Washington Post is read by people who think they ought to be running the country. <laughs> USA Today is read by people who think they ought to be running the country, but don't understand the Washington Post. <laughs> the Boston Globe is read by people whose parents used to run the country. <laughs> The New York Daily News is read by people who aren't too sure who's running the country. <laughs> the New York Post is read by people who don't care who's running the country so long as they do something scandalous. <laughs> the San Francisco Chronicle is read by people who aren't sure there is a country or that anyone is running it. <laughs> the Miami Herald is read by people who are running another country. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.